Well, good morning again, brethren. It's uh, wonderful uh, to be able to be up here and be able to see you as, as always. And uh, clearly, uh, we, we have much to be thankful for, a lot to be grateful for and appreciate. And yet, as we watch uh, the world continue to decline, I guess that would be the only way you could describe it. Uh, pretty much chaotic situations in many different places around the world. Uh, nations changing. This nation, in a sense, changing. You know, we don't know exactly what all God is going to allow. We kind of know the outcome of it. We know there's going to be decline. But we don't know exactly how that's going to happen. And of course, we've endured you know, the past year of, of disease around the world and affecting people in many different ways, affecting the e economic situation. In many ways, uh, you would look at these things and say they are bad. There are bad things that are happening in the world. You could also say that in many ways they are discouraging. It's discouraging to see people suffer. And of course, I don't think any of us, any of us, because I do know of many of the different ailments that some of you suffer. I know not only of ailments that Pat and I suffer and that you suffer, but more so even, you know, some of the family situations that are distressing uh, the difficulties that we're faced, and many times we may not be directly trying to solve them, but at least we're dealing with them. Uh, we send out prayer requests almost uh, every week. We, we have a few at least that we send to you and ask you to be aware of that. And of course, uh, all of these that I send out, which I, I send out occasionally some on a wider scale, I send to all of us, things local that, that we are aware of with one another. Uh, but we send out prayer requests, and many of those uh, describe just very, very bad situations. I mean, often it actually ends up being somewhat more severe that you end up sending it to a, a wider group of people and ask for their prayers. I was just thinking about this with one of these last ones that we got. Uh, this, uh, this lady in San Jose, California, I'm going to go through all of the details, but she goes through uh, chemo treatments, undoubtedly for some type of cancer. Uh, she's suffering loss of hair, uh, aches in her arms and legs. Uh, somehow is managing to deal with a colostomy bag during chemotherapy. I mean, that, that is, each one of these seems like it just kind of gets worse and worse. And of course, you know, she needs to have some type of surgery. See, each one of those, you know, I wouldn't want any of them, but, you know, these are all happening to this lady, and she's trying to be optimistic, trying to be, uh, smile and be happy and, and look to God for help. Look to God for intervention. Uh, it says she's very thankful to God for his mercy and intervention and to everyone for their kindness and their continued prayers. See, that's, of course, the type of thing that we often get, many of which are, in a sense, distressing situations, and yet people looking to God, asking for help, uh, needing intervention from God, and of course, we're, we're aware of all of those. And so, in addition to that, you know, we all have our own personal battles, our own personal struggles against sin. And sometimes we see success and sometimes we see progress that is yet to be. I guess you could say, you know, it's yet to, yet to happen. God is yet to answer or to provide help for us. So, in a sense, if we look at the world, we find that, you know, it's a discouraging place. And not only do we need encouragement and need be able to battle discouragement, but uh, really the whole world needs encouragement. They need some hope. 
and yet, you know, we find it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to find in this world. Clearly, Satan wants us to lose heart. He wants us to become so discouraged, you know, we just get weary in well-doing. So, how can we prepare for each day and whatever challenges we may face every day? Because all of us need hope. We need encouragement. Now, I could say that the answer to how do I, how do I prepare to be encouraged each day or how do I get up each morning and want to get out and go do whatever I need to do that day, uh, how do I do that? How do you do that? You know, what I find if I'm kind of down, if I'm kind of discouraged, or if I happen to just hurt more than other days, I'm not as prone. I don't feel as good. I don't feel as uh, energetic about going to God, about seeking God and His help. And yet all of us know the answer to any kind of discouragement is God. We know that He's the one who's able to help us. And yet many times we feel, you know, I, I feel lethargic in coming to God. Or in reading, you know, what do I read? Um, I don't know, what do you read? You know, you, if you have some kind of pattern or if you have some type of a, a guide that you're using as far as studying the Bible, uh, that's going to help. But see, you know, whenever we're down, we often overlook the obvious. And that, of course, is that in overcoming discouragement, in being encouraged, we have to keep God in the forefront of our mind. We have to keep God in the forefront of our mind. I want to read a couple of verses here that... I'm sure you so surely have read. You know, Jeremiah wrote the book of Lamentations uh, pretty much as they were in captivity. Judah was in captivity to Babylon. And Jeremiah was essentially a part of that. He had kind of watched that take place. He watched the continued decline in Judah and then ultimately the overthrow of the nation. And then he's in decline with them. He's struggling with that. And yet these, these laments that we read about, chapter 3 is actually in many ways kind of positive in that it tells us he, he is lamenting being in captivity, struggling with losing freedom, a losing ability to do maybe what he had done before, maybe trying to get some of that back. He says in verse 17, My soul is bereft of peace. I think I've forgotten what happiness is. You know, that was, that was his state of mind. That, that's what he was thinking about. I want us to drop down, though, to verse 21. What does it say? Even in despair, even in distress, it says in verse 21, but this, this I call to mind. This I keep in my head. Therefore, I have hope. And so here he's pointing out something that, well, I've got to keep this in mind. I have got to have this in the forefront of my mind. In verse 22, he says, The steadfast love of the Lord, God's loving kindness toward each one of us, never ceases. His mercy never comes to an end. It never ends. In verse 23, he says, They are new every morning. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. You know, that's a verse some of you have memorized. It's a good one to keep in mind. It's an encouraging verse because it points out the answer to discouragement. It points out the answer uh, to even dealing with distressing situations where he said, I've, 
I don't have anything to be happy for. And yet, he points out that, well, I, I need to keep this in mind, that God's love and His mercy for me never ceases. He is concerned about me. If we back up to, in the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 30, you see another situation where, again, a servant of God. You could say clearly that Jeremiah was a prophet of God. He was a servant of God. And David was, uh, in essence, the most uh, you know, renowned king of Israel. Now, clearly, when we read about David's life, we read about a lot of things, a lot of ups and downs. He had a lot of distressing things happen in his life, and he created some of them. And yet, he was always willing to come to God and ask for help. But here in 1 Samuel 30, you see an example here of, of a city named Ziklag. You know, that's not one that I commonly think about or read. But in this particular situation, David uh, had been uh, fighting for Israel. And yet, back in Zik Ziklag, that's even hard to say, uh, he found when they returned there that the city, if we look in verse 3, when they returned, what did they find? Uh, well, the city had been burned down. Uh, their families, their wives and families had been taken away. In verse 4, they raised their voices and wept until they, you know, they they were, had no more strength to weep. See, all the people were in distress. David was in distress. In verse 5, it talks about David's wives being taken captive. And in verse 6, he was in great danger because the people spoke of stoning him. Because all the people were bitter in spirit because of their sons and daughters. I mean, this is obviously a very distressing situation. Now, when you read through the remainder of the chapter, you see that, well, God restored that. He actually caused David and his band to catch up with them, to retrieve everyone else. Actually, I guess verse 19 says David brought everything back. You know, God, God solved the problem. But see, how did David view not only this distressing situation, but also uh, the fact that it looked like people were going to stone him because, you know, how did this happen? Verse 6 is what I want to focus on. The latter part of it says David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Now I think that's a very important statement because like I said, whenever I feel kind of down, I don't always feel like praying. I don't always feel like reading and trying to absorb something that I know I need. And yet that's exactly the answer. That's what should be done. You find in other places that, you know, it's helpful to hide the Word of God in our heart. Psalm 119, verse 11 tells us that it's important to hide the Word of God in our heart. Now, I, m I mention this only in line with being encouraged. How to overcome discouragement? Well, in a sense, you have to do the right thing, and we know what the right thing is, but sometimes we need to be encouraged just to, just to do the right thing. And I hope, in pointing this out, that, that it can be a benefit to you. And to me, because I need to do this as well. So, I've got three, three points that I want to mention here. And I, I believe uh, that we are able to achieve all of these. Uh, we just have to remember that God is the one who is able to lift us up out of discouragement. Lift us out of, you could even say, depression. We can be depressed, and certainly there are many different factors that cause depression. And that's, I'm not saying, oh, well, this is just a simple answer. You know, that can be a complex situation. But being discouraged or being frustrated over something that isn't, hasn't gone right, uh, God can help us with that. 
And again, I think all of us realize that. We know that that's the case. We know that God could help us. But see, we may not remember. My first, my first point here, I think probably is one of the more important of the three. It has to do uh, with going to the right source. See, now when my brother David and uh, his wife visited us last week, uh, they live in Anchorage. You know, they came down and they were here for a couple of days at our house and then went on to see their kids over in Tennessee. Now every time David shows up, I, I'm trying to get him to do something to help fix something that doesn't work at the house. Last time he fixed the uh, stove. He fixed the heating element in the stove. Now I had the healing element, I just didn't want to, you know, I might blow up this electric stove or electrocute myself. I, don't, I want him, he is an electrician, so, or he was at one point, and so he knows how to do that kind of stuff, and I'm glad to let him do it. And yet this time, uh, we had been um, enduring, I guess you could say, although it's kind of something that we, Pat and we being Pat and I, we've, we've gotten kind of used to. In our kitchen, uh, there's a fixture overhead, and it's kind of an enclosed thing, and so up inside of it, there's two strips of kind of shop-like type things that have got two fluorescent bulbs in them. And I have messed with those and messed with those and messed with those, and usually can only get two of the four bulbs to work, which gives enough light, you know, plenty of light. Actually, this past time, or over quite some time now, I've only been able to get one of the four to work. And so interestingly, you know, David comes into the house, he gets up into the kitchen, he says, don't you guys like to turn the lights on? And said, so, well, this is all that works. And we're kind of used to it, and so we don't, we don't think about it much. And so uh, I was going to get him, or he actually volunteered. Well, is there anything we can do to fix that? I said, oh, yeah, I'm sure there is. But you're going to have to help me figure out what, I, I mean, I've looked at it, and I knew, you know, I need to get rid of these old fixtures. You know, two newer fixtures would surely work better. And I wouldn't have to be, one, oh, the other thing that went wrong with the light, you know, that one of the, the ballast starts buzzing. And, you know, one didn't work enough at all to even do that. And the other, after about uh, 48 minutes, it would buzz. It would start buzzing. So I'd turn it off. You know, wait a while. It'll turn it back on. It was, it was not an ideal situation, but something that, uh, I knew, having looked at it and studied it, and I thought, oh, I think I could fix that. But the, the fixtures needed to be replaced, so I needed just two, two new fixtures. And uh, even the way they were connected to the ceiling. It, it was just really a very poor, whoever had done it earlier, very poor situation of how they were even connected. So I knew that I needed two, two new fixtures and and then the, all the little, little thigmajigs that you'd have to have to connect them to the ceiling. And so, you know, we headed out to find, to find what we had figured out we need. Now, we did not choose to go to the Pizza Hut to get that stuff. We didn't choose to go uh, to, you know, a McDonald's to get that. We went to Lowe's. You know, we went to the right spot. We went to the right source. Now, even Lowe's didn't have what we needed, and so we had to go on down the street a little bit further to get to Menards, who has everything, or at least many things, if you can find anything in there. And so... You know, we found that they had the fixtures we need. They had all the little gizmos you had to have to attach it. And, uh, but they didn't have, they didn't have uh, the covers that you would need to, you know, get rid of the terribly darkened ones that probably had been there for 30 years. Uh, nice, clear new ones. 
See, now, the point of that kind of, we did get it fixed, and we now have more light than we ever can stand, so we, we can at least turn it on and off. And so uh, it's wonderful. But the point of that little story is that in order to get what we needed, actually we ended up having to go back to Lowe's to get the covers, but in order to get what we needed, we had to go to the right source. We had to go to the right spot to be able to get that. And so that's actually my first point. Whenever we're discouraged, whenever we need to be uplifted and encouraged, we have to realize God is the source. He is the right source in order to get comfort, in order to get strength, to be able to endure. And even though that's completely obvious, I point that out because that isn't always what I think of. And that may not be always what you think of. And yet it should be. You know, we have to go to the right source. You know, as I said, as you think about all the bad things and the aches and pains and stuff that happen, uh, what is the message that we proclaim? It's the kingdom of God, of course, and we know ultimately that's going to be the answer to many of the ills that the world has. And yet, see, what does the word gospel mean? What is God giving to the world? He is giving good news, not bad news. He's giving good news. Now, there are going to be some rough times between now and Christ's installation of the kingdom of God in Jerusalem on the earth. There'll be rough times, yes. But see, the good news is that God is going to bring that kingdom. And that God is then going to be offering salvation to the entirety of the world in His order. Now we know that, well, we're a part of that right now. We have been blessed with the knowledge of God's intent. But when we read in Mark 1, verse 14, that Jesus came and he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, the good news of the kingdom of God, we want to be reminded that I have to have God in the forefront of my mind, even whenever things seem to be going wrong, even when I might be discouraged. Here in James chapter 1, James chapter 1, it says in verse 17, Every generous act of giving, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change or shadow. See, now again, we, that's kind of worded a little differently than we probably would normally think about it, but what it tells us is that God, our Father, our loving Father, the one who His love never fails and it's renewed every morning, He is the source. He's the right source the right source of every good gift. And see, that's what we need. We need a gift of encouragement, a gift of being lifted up, a gift of being comforted. And yet, if we neglect going to the right source, if we neglect seeking that source, well, then that may be a part of why you know, we have difficulty kind of being encouraged. So, God is His source of comfort and strength. Here in Philippians chapter 4, Philippians chapter 4, you, you find again a statement that Paul makes that, again, we read quite often, and yet it, it tells us, in a sense, kind of a summary here, 
He's exhorting at the end of this book here in Philippians 4 in this last chapter. He's exhorting the members of the church to, in verse 4, Philippians 4, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now again, very general statement, very easy to understand, and yet we might neglect that, or we might not take our request to the right source. You know, many times, you know, who's the alternate source? You know, it's me. You know, I'm trying to figure it out myself. I'm trying to do something that I think will help or I think will work. But that may not be the answer. That may not be the answer at all. I need to take it to God. I need to do what it says here, primarily in verse 6. And then it says, whenever we take our requests, take our needs to God, we're seeking See, he tells us in verse 4 to rejoice. You know, where, where does joy come from? Who is the source of joy? Who is the source of love or joy or peace? Even of all the other fruits of the Holy Spirit. Well, God clearly is the one who gives those gifts. He's the one who can give us the gift of joy or the gift of happiness. He's the one that we need to turn to in order to seek that. Uh, here in, I think it's 2 Corinthians. I believe I've got that written down wrong. Yeah, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. It says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercy, the God of all comfort. The God of, He has comfort to give. Who, verse 4, consoles us or comforts us in all of our afflictions so that we may be able to console others who are in also in affliction with the consolation with which we ourselves are consoled by God. Now here, you know, we've seen that, well, God's the source of every good gift. He's the source of joy. He's the source of comfort. And so... You know, we need to make our requests known to God, and then we need to rely on His providing those gifts. See, those gifts are what we need. You know, we have, you know, a great blessing. You find that Paul is aware of this. We all know that Paul struggled through a lot of things. Whenever he lists the things that he endured, the rejection, you know, the imprisonments, uh, the shipwreck, uh, the beatings, the stoning, you know, things that Paul mentions that he endured. You know, you wonder, well, how could he just keep doing, he'd keep coming back? Actually, it's amazing to see when he was in, I think it was Lystra, where he was stoned. Uh, the next few days, he wanted to go back through there again. I think I would avoid that town, you know, after, uh, you know, wouldn't take me too long to figure out, I think we can go another way. But that's what Paul did. And yet here in Philippians 4, a little bit later on, Philippians chapter 4, verse 10, he says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at last you have revived your concern for me. And in verse 11, I'm not referring to being in need, because I've learned to be content. I've learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little. I know what it is to have lots. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret. So there, there must be a secret to it. There, there is a secret to battling discouragement. See, that secret, as he says, I have learned, I have learned 
the secret of being well fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and being in need, because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, what, what Paul was describing there was a contentment. He didn't have to solve all his problems. He, he couldn't even get away from all of them. He said he struggled through many of these things, and then he also had you know, others who were constantly against him, those who were criticizing him, even false brethren who were trying to you know, tear him down. And yet he says, I, I just re- refer that to God. I take that to the source of comfort, the source of strength, the source of encouragement. And so, you know, this first point that I want to make for all of us is just simply that, you know, we don't want to ignore, even when things are not so good, we don't want to ignore going to the right source to be picked up, to be encouraged, because God is able to do that. Now, see, is that a gift from God? Well, yeah, it is. It's a gift. And many times we think we can work that up ourselves, or we should work it up, or I should just be better, or I need to think of some other way to solve this. Well, maybe God wants us to just simply take that to Him and ask Him for help. The second thing that I'll point out about being encouraged and fighting discouragement is simply that Uh, The Holy Spirit has been made available to us. And it actually, you know, we often think of the Holy Spirit being a gift from God, which it is. He says that, you know, if you repent and are baptized, you shall receive the gift. A gift of the Holy Spirit. And so even that is a gift from God that He has given us, but... We need to be reminded that the the Holy Spirit enables us. It gives us the power and the strength uh, to edify, to educate, and even to comfort others. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, or 14, excuse me. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 lists a number of the Gifts of the Spirit. number of spiritual gifts are listed there. And again, I'm not wanting to read through all of those and to think about, you know, how, how are the... What I'm wanting to point out is simply that the Holy Spirit has been a gift to us initially. It is not something we should neglect. We're told that. Don't quench it. Don't neglect it. Don't misunderstand what God has made available to us. But you see that in chapter 12, many spiritual gifts come through the power of the Holy Spirit. And of course, chapter 13 is an entire listing of what it is, uh, how it is that love from God is described. And of course, that's, a, that's an excellent chapter to read and reread and continue to think about, well, how God can manifest that, or how He does manifest that to us, how He wants to manifest that in us. He he wants us to become like Him. But what I want to point out is here in chapter 14. Chapter 14 says, Pursue love, and strive for the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy or speak and preach uh, in a prophetic way. He goes on to describe, and of course he was addressing a certain issue because people there in Corinth were, uh, in a sense, troubled by a gift of tongues. They, They didn't use it properly. They, maybe if they were interacting with different people, maybe even people who spoke different languages, uh, they simply didn't use that gift however it manifests itself in in their lives, they didn't use it properly. He says in verse 2, For those who speak in a tongue do not speak to other people but to God, for nobody understands them since they are speaking mysteries in the Spirit. He says, 
This is, this is not meant to be confusing. It's not meant, as even many people probably misunderstand today, that this has you know, some kind of a, 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 an aggrandizement of ourselves. That's, that's not what this is. But he says, unless you're speaking something that people, you know, if I were to try to speak German, which I took a little bit and spoke to you, unless you understood German, it really wouldn't do much good at all. And even though we're speaking English today, uh, all of us at least can understand it. And he goes on in verse 3 to say, on the other hand, those who prophesy speak to other people. And so here he says, this is what each of us can do with the gift of the Holy Spirit. We can speak to one another for their upbuilding, for their encouragement, and for their consolation. Consolation. See, now verse 3 is what I'm wanting to focus on because, you know, this is describing a situation where our words, our words are able to edify. They are able to educate. They are able to provide comfort. And see, that's something that God expects of us. We've been given the Holy Spirit, but that Holy Spirit enables us to say and do things that will be encouraging to others, that will be comforting to others, that will be uplifting to others. And again, if we don't realize that that's what God's able to do through us, well, then we may miss that altogether. But see, that's a big part of what we are needing to do. And of course, you might say, well, how do my words, how do my words encourage or how do they uplift? Well, I think just interacting with one another and, and sharing with one another, even things that we we're struggling with and that we pray for one another as we do. Uh, you all are very good here in this congregation of sending cards, sending letters. Some of you are excellent, unbelievably good, and even gifted at doing that. And there are some people who are probably more used to doing that or more. And that's fine. But see, I don't want us to ever not think that that's important. Because if God gives us a gift of being able to encourage others with our words, it's not just maybe what we speak, but what we write. You know, I can say that Pat does a good job of contacting many of the people that we get, you know, all over the world uh, who are asking for prayer. She often, if they have an address, she sends them a card, as often we do up here from, from the congregation. And some of you surely do that, even on your own. You do that, and you're very good at that. And I'm thankful that God en enables and empowers you to do it. But sometimes, you know, we, we may wonder about the impact of our cards or of our prayers what kind of an impact do they have on other people? Well, some of us have been recipients of those kind of cards. I know several years ago, I got a lot of cards whenever I was down for a while. And, and so did Pat, really. And, and yet, you know, that's something that you see and you probably, I'm sure I've got a stack of cards somewhere. I haven't gone through and read them recently. And yet... Do you think that's a real impact, a real benefit, a real encouragement to other people to send a card? I want, I want to read to you what it is that we got actually just yesterday. Pat got this note from one of the ladies who had asked for prayer and, you know, an address was there, so obviously she did send them a card. And yet... Uh, She's kind of written this out for me, so I can't misstate it. I want to be able to do this. 
We received a thank you note from a member uh, for a get well card that we sent recently. And after giving an update on how she is doing, uh, this is what this member wrote. This lady is in another state here in the United States, so we don't really know who she is except the name and whatever it was that she was struggling with. Actually, a different one that I read about earlier. Uh, and, and yet, many times you find similar situations. But this lady wrote back, and she was actually thanking whoever had sent her a card. In this case, it was Pat, not me, but from us. And this lady wrote, she said, the card you sent had a scripture from Isaiah printed on it. And I have kept a list of all the scriptures that people have shared with me since my diagnosis, along with their names. So she's making a, a listing of scriptures and people who are aware of and praying for her. She says, each time I go to chemo, I read through all of these scriptures, and they have been a great source of comfort and encouragement to me. I have added your verse to my list. And so thank you for devoting a section of your valuable prayer time to me and my well-being. You, through God's mercy, have given me an immeasurable gift. And so I thank you. Now I point this out solely because not only do you do this kind of as a congregation, but many of you do this on your own. See, this is a way where we can allow a gift from God of His Spirit to help us be encouraging, help us be edifying or educating, trying to provide benefit and uplift to others. And see, that's a, that's a part of what God really expects us to do. He wants us to do that. And whether we think we're good at it or whether, you know, I, I uh, like I said, I did receive several years ago a number of cards. I've, I'm sure it was in the 50s or 60s or 70s. Uh, I don't recall at this point, but I do recall one. Actually, this was a card that was sent to Pat whenever she had been sick the year before. Uh, this was from a guy down in Florida. And uh, this is a memorable card, not because of the nice card and because of the scripture verse and because of whatever he happened to write on there. But when we opened up the envelope, there was a, a what looked to me like a piece or the end of another envelope. And it said, praying, Paul. That was it. That was all that was in there. But see, at least I remember that one. I can remember everything that was on it. He was simply sending a little note. Either he didn't have more paper or what. I don't know. He, he just tore the rest of an envelope off put it in another envelope and sent it on, praying, Paul. I, I actually know who this man is. Uh, I have not talked to him since then, but I've seen him at the feast before. I'm seeing, I've seen him, I know who he is. I know, you know where he lives. I know what his name is. But that, that made, that made uh, a notice in our mind that, well, people are... You know, people are concerned. They're, they're not just, you know, and maybe, you know, maybe he is very limited even at, at able to send a card. He sent a card that we remember and one that, you know, we simply won't forget. And yet, see, I think that is a part of a working of the Holy Spirit, a part of the gift of the Holy Spirit to enable us to encourage others. And the final thing I'll mention, this third point that I'll make today, is that we have a family of believers that we are close to. We are close to each other here. We're close to people that we know in Kansas City and in numerous other places. We've often gone to the feast together and 
celebrated together, the Feast of Tabernacles. You know, there, there's a grouping of people from the surrounding areas that we are very close to. But we have a family of believers uh, that we need to encourage, that we need to give to them. See, that's actually in any kind of a, uh, what, what would you call it, any kind of a, a recovery uh, program that you have. You generally uh, are working on overcoming a given problem, but you often are learning toward the end of the guide in that program that, well, you need to try to give back to others. You need to help other people. And that's, that's similar in many different programs. And yet it's kind of what we read here about how that we have a family of believers that we need to encourage. Here in Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10 is a, a wonderful chapter. And of course it's got a lot of direction for us, but in Hebrews chapter 10, it says in verse 23, let us hold fast to our profession or confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting meeting together is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, exhorting one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. See, that talks about us coming together. That talks about us lifting each other up with our discussions and with our, with our words. It talks about encouraging one another to grow in love and grow in good deeds. And so... You know, whatever our, our sphere of influence is, whoever it is we happen to know, you know, we have an obligation, you know, to be encouraging to them and to reach out to them and lift them up. Because many times we may not fully know. We may not fully know what others are going through. But we do know that we have a responsibility, what it says in verse 24 and 25, that we are to be encouraging, exhorting, uplifting uh, to one another. And of course, there are many other verses you could go to that would, would follow up on that. But that's the third thing I'll mention, that we, we have uh, a way to battle discouragement ourselves. And often that is being, look, thinking outside our own, our own situation, thinking of what others are going through thinking about how we could contribute. Now, that, that may vary from all of us, how we could do that. But each of us have at least an opportunity to do that if we, if we are mindful of that. The concluding thing that you see here in this, in this chapter, because, of course, chapter 11 is going to go into a discussion of, of many different people of faith, but it says in verse 32, Hebrews 10, 32, recall earlier days when you were enlightened, when you were initially exposed to the truth of God and to the redemptive power that Jesus provides Recall these earlier days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with suffering and sometimes being publicly exposed to abuse and persecution and sometimes being partners with those so treated. Verse 34, you had compassion. You had compassion on those who were in prison and you cheerfully accepted the plundering of your possessions knowing that you yourselves possess something far better and more lasting. See, he's talking to those who would understand the, the spiritual dimension that God has made available in our lives. But he goes on in concluding here, do not therefore abandon that current confidence of yours. It brings a great reward because you simply need to endure. You have need an endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive 
what has been promised. See, we want to inherit eternal life. Uh, we want to grow in a divine nature today. And we want to be able to rise out of discouragement and depression that others may suffer uh, unwittingly. They may not even know what to do. But brethren, we do know because the Word of God says. And if I would have asked you before, you know, what could you do? Well, you should go to God. Well, correct. But see, do we need to be reminded that I've got to keep that in mind? Well, that's what this sermon is designed to do. So, we can, we can battle and we can overcome discouragement by doing these three things that I mentioned. By seeking the true source of help. Seeking God's help. Knowing that He is with us through His Spirit. He's given us His Spirit he wants us to be motivated by it. Uh, if we are thanking Him and asking, asking Him for His help, but thanking Him for what He has given us as a gift to be able to help others, uh, then we will involve ourselves in encouraging one another. And with God helping us that way, then we will be. We will be encouraged. We will be victorious. And as we read earlier there in Lamentations, His love for us, His concern for us is renewed every day. We don't want to neglect that at any time. And so as we do it, uh, then you know, we can uh, benefit greatly from uh, being encouraged ourselves and by, in so doing, uh, encouraging one another and helping them along the way.